uh, I'm just going to get started. All right, awesome. All right, so today we welcome Dr. Sarah Horst. Sarah is an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Sarah got her bachelor's degree from Caltech in 2004, so she just missed me by <laughs> one year. Um, <laughs> So we didn't actually overlap, but after that she worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for NASA for one year, and then after that she went to the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, really awesome graduate program in planetary science, and got her PhD in 2011. After that, uh, she won the NSF Astronomy and Astrophysics Postdoctoral Fellowship and was a prize postdoc at the University of Colorado before joining the faculty at Johns Hopkins University in 2014. Sarah's research, as you can tell from the, uh, from the title, involves atmospheric chemistry, and in particular, she's very interested in understanding how complex organic molecules, aka the building blocks of life, develop on planetary bodies. So with that, uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for coming, and um, I'm excited to hear all about this. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I was having last minute. And you get a, and you get a oh, thank you. Five, thank you. <laughs> I, was, I was having last minute debate about which version of this talk I was going to give. Um, so this is the one I settled on, apparently. Uh, but I'm probably going to skip um, a couple of slides because there's some stuff at the end that I want to talk about because it's actually the thing that I'm most excited about right now. Um, so I want to make sure that I have some time to at least um, mention that. So I'm going to talk about a series of experiments that I've been working on since I was a graduate student to try to help us build a more robust framework for understanding how planetary atmospheric chemistry works, um, not just in the solar system, but actually all over the universe. Uh, before I talk about that too much, I just want to quickly acknowledge um, my research group at Johns Hopkins, uh, and in particular, hopefully my new laser, my new laser printer does work. Um, in particular, I just want to acknowledge um, Chow He, who is uh, now a research scientist in my group, um, but started out as a postdoc with me and has been there since the very first day when my lab was um, torn down to the studs and has been really instrumental in getting up and going a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and also just want to quickly acknowledge um, the NASA Exoplanet Research Program, which funded a lot of the work that um, I'm going to show. Before we get started, I always have this little nomenclature slide because planets are confusing and words are confusing, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what I mean when I say certain things. Um, and so I just want to go through a few quick definitions. Um, so when I say cloud, what I mean is a visible mass of liquid or solid particles that are suspended in atmosphere that form from condensation of atmospheric gases. So on Earth, it's really obvious what we mean when we say a cloud because we're talking about water that has condensed. And it might have formed ice or it might have formed droplets, but it's a water cloud um, and it's fairly straightforward. The thing about clouds is that you can go back and forth across that phase change boundary pretty quickly. So if you move the parcel of air uh, to a different pressure, different temperature, you might have the, um, the materials go back and forth across the phase boundary relatively easily. Um, this tends to result in clouds being uh, somewhat transient features. Um, they tend to have um, poorly defined boundaries. Uh, and so that's kind of what I think about when I say cloud. Um, haze is something different, uh, and it means something very different to the Earth community than it means to the rest of the universe atmosphere community. Um, for us, what we mean when we say haze um, are particles that are produced from chemistry in the atmosphere that result in the formation of involatile solids. So this is chemistry that has, has created material that's kind of on a one-way trip. Once this material is solid, it is solid. And if you move the parcel of air, even to pretty dramatically different temperatures or pressures, you're not going to change the phase of the material because it's been pushed so far into the solid phase. Um, if you were to collect these particles and actually measure them, what you would likely find out is that the materials contained in the particle aren't actually seen in the gas phase in the atmosphere, unlike with a water cloud where you always have some water vapor. And so haze are very different types of particles. Um, 
Because they're often generated uh, through photochemistry, they tend to be more global in extent in most of the places where we see them, unlike a cloud. Um, and finally, and this is just here for when I talk to exoplanet people, there's a lovely word that encompasses both of these categories that I'm trying to get the exoplanet community to use, um, which is aerosol, which is just a particle suspended in a gas. We don't have to know anything else about it um, other than that it's there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why we care about particles in a second, but I wanted us to get on the same page first before I said anything else. So I'm going to talk about a few specific places um, today because they're where we've learned a lot of um, important lessons about atmospheric chemistry. And so the examples that I'm going to draw from are Titan, Pluto, exoplanets, and I think I think this version of this talk has some early Earth in it. I'm not 100% sure. We'll, we'll find out. Um, before I jump into those, though, I want to tell you what our big questions are, um, what we're trying to figure out. And there's two questions that are related. So one of the questions that I've been most interested um, in, and Sonia alluded to it when she uh, was giving that really lovely introduction, is trying to understand how far organic chemistry can proceed in the absence of life, um, and in particular how far organic chemistry can proceed in the absence of life in an atmosphere. There's a lot of different reasons why we want to know the answer to that question. Um, one of the reasons is because that material may be important for either the origin or evolution of life on a planet where chemistry like this is occurring. So that material may have been important for the origin or evolution of life here on Earth. Um, but also because if we're starting to think about um, looking for life on other planets, if we're thinking about looking for life on an extrasolar planet or on Mars or on Titan, we really need to understand the difference between a biogenic and abiogenic signature. We need to know if we see organics in an atmosphere, if that means something about life on that planet or not. And so that's one of the reasons that we really need to start thinking about these questions. A little bit related to that, one of the other big questions that I'm really interested in trying to answer is what role does haze in particular play in the habitability of a world? And the reason that that question comes up is that particles interact with light differently than gases do. And so if you have particles in an atmosphere, they can really strongly affect the temperature structure of an atmosphere. So the presence of a haze layer might mean the difference between water being able to be liquid on the surface of a planet or not. Um, because these particles interact with light differently, they may also do something like shield UV photons out. We think that may have happened on the early Earth if early Earth had a global haze layer. That might be important for life as well to protect nascent life from harmful UV photons. Um, again, these, these particles might uh, serve as a source of material for the origin of life um, based on what they're composed of. And so these are two of the questions that we're really interested in trying to understand um, in terms of atmospheric chemistry. So in the solar system, if you want to study haze formation, the very, very best place to study is Titan. Um, this is Titan from Voyager. Uh, and I always joke with everyone that you too can recreate the Voyager flyby of Titan in your own home with your iPhone and an orange. Um, although you'll actually get a much higher resolution photo um, than Voyager got of Titan. And so when Voyager flew through the Saturn system in the early 1980s, this is what we got back. Um, which is really, really frustrating to a planetary scientist because there's very little information contained in this image. Um, there is a global haze layer, uh, that much we know. Voyager was carrying an infrared spectrometer called IRIS, and from the Voyager data, we really got our first glimpse into, into understanding how complex organic chemistry can be in the atmosphere of a planet that presumably does not have life. Um, or at least does not have the, the extent of life that we have here on Earth. So from, from IRIS, we detected uh, molecules like propane. So if you want to have your you know, Titan barbecue over the weekend, plenty of propane around. Um, there's also the signature of hydrogen cyanide. So if you don't like the people you're inviting over for your barbecue, there's an easy solution to that problem. Um, and so from Voyager, we found all of these complex organics in the atmosphere. And so we knew two things, really from the Voyager flyby that Titan has this atmosphere with this thick organic haze layer, that it has this really robust organic chemistry. And if you look at all the molecules that are listed there, one of the things that might jump out at you, um, especially if you think about chemistry very often, is that most of these molecules are hydrocarbons. So they're just made out of carbon and hydrogen. And so we got this idea in our head that has persisted to this day, um, despite now many, many years uh, of additional study and another mission, that Titan's atmospheric chemistry is hydrocarbon chemistry. And therefore, Titan has a hydrocarbon haze layer. 
And so this is kind of where we start. And this is, this is where I enter the picture a little bit in terms of thinking about how haze formation works. So we started with this idea from this one really good example that we have in the solar system, that organic haze is produced from photochemistry acting on methane in atmospheres that are mildly reduced. So Titan's atmosphere is not fully reduced. It's not like a giant planet where we just see so much hydrogen um, with a little bit of other fully reduced species. Um, so this was our idea of, of where this chemistry would happen. And this is, this is our organic chemistry haven. Um, Titan's hydrocarbon haze, I said that already. So people started doing experiments to try to understand what happens in Titan's atmosphere. And so they started taking methane and nitrogen. Nitrogen is the main atmospheric constituent, about 98%. And they started running chemistry experiments like the type that I do, which I'll tell you about more in a second. You take these gases, you expose them to an energy source, and you figure out what gets made. Um, these experiments were pioneered by the very famous Miller-Urey experiment, although they were trying to figure out the answers to different questions. Um, and so people started with this starting point. And one of the things that we found out almost immediately is that nitrogen plays a really important role in this chemistry. And so the nitrogen is actually getting pulled into the solid phase. And so all of those beautiful particles that you see in this image, which is now from the Cassini spacecraft, are probably very nitrogen rich. We don't see as much nitrogen in the gas phase, like when we were looking with the infrared spectrometer, because the nitrogen is getting pulled into the solid. Um, and one of the other things that we learned is that actually the presence of the nitrogen itself is really important for particle formation. And so it acts almost as a catalyst, really increasing the amount of haze particles that are made in the first place. If you were to run one of these experiments just with methane, you actually don't make very much material. When you put the nitrogen in is when you really start to get this, this very robust production of organic haze. Um, so it's not a hydrocarbon haze, and it's not just hydrocarbon chemistry. So why does that matter? Um, the reason that that matters, going back to my big picture question, is that all of life on Earth is built on a small set of molecules. And those small set of molecules are all built on the same small set of atoms. And so you know, the four that we tend to care about the most, at least in the context of planetary exploration right now, are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. And so from our Voyager perspective, we had this really interesting organic chemistry that was using carbon and hydrogen, but that's only two of the four that we really need. And the experimental work that was done in the intervening years between Voyager and Cassini started to tell us that nitrogen was probably playing a really important role too. So that gives us three of the four. But then Cassini told us something interesting. So this is just another pretty picture from, from Cassini, um, looking at Titan and Saturn now. Cassini was carrying a plasma spectrometer that was meant to study the, the magnetospheric environment in the Saturn system. It wasn't really meant to tell us anything particularly interesting about Titan at all. Um, but pretty early on in the mission, it found something odd, um, which is not a pretty picture. Uh, it's really an image that only a uh, plasma scientist could love. Um, but what this graph is telling you is that there's energetic oxygen ions flowing into the top of Titan's atmosphere. So KEV oxygen flowing into the top of Titan's atmosphere at a flux of about 10 to 6 per centimeter squared per second, which is a pretty high flux. Um, this is weird, and I hope the very first question that you have is where is this oxygen coming from that's flowing into the top of Titan's atmosphere? Um, and I assume that not all of you know the answer, so get ready because this is really exciting. Um, and it turns out that the answer is Enceladus. So this teeny, teeny, tiny moon of Saturn called Enceladus has giant plumes of water shooting out of the South Pole. They get photolyzed by solar photons. They hitch a ride on the magnetic field lines out to um, Titan. And so we have this flux of oxygen coming into the top of Titan's atmosphere. And we actually know what um, that material is made out of because after many, many long arguments with engineers, they finally agreed to actually let uh, people fly Cassini through that um, with the mass spectrometer and actually collect plume particles and measure them. Um, and they look like that. Um, so the plume particles are primarily water, which shouldn't be surprising given that I just told you that they're plumes of water. Um, there's also a little bit of CO2 and some organics, and it's a whole separate talk about what this tells us about why Enceladus might be interesting for life, uh, but I'm not gonna give that talk today. That material goes out to Titan, and it turns out that it actually um, participates in Titan's atmospheric chemistry producing carbon monoxide, which is the fourth most abundant molecule in Titan's atmosphere. 
And it only exists because of the plumes of Enceladus. That's actually work that I did um, as a grad student. And so the interesting thing about this is now Cassini has told us it's not just carbon and hydrogen, which we knew from Voyager. It's not just carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, which we learned from modeling and from experiments. But there's actually oxygen present in the atmosphere as well. And it's present in the region of the atmosphere where really exciting chemistry is happening. We didn't know how exciting until that very same instrument that was not designed to measure Titan at all um, made what I think is one of the most important discoveries from the Cassini mission, but it doesn't have a pretty picture, and so it's a little bit hard to get people excited about it, but I'm gonna try. So I showed you the Voyager infrared spectrum, and after Voyager, some ground-based telescopes and Earth-based telescopes were able to discover some additional molecules in Titan's atmosphere. So by the time Cassini got to Titan, we knew that the heaviest molecule we had ever detected in Titan's atmosphere was benzene, which is C6H6, that has a mass of 78. It's actually the heaviest molecule that has ever been detected in a planetary atmosphere other than Earth. Um, and so our kind of pre-Cassini ideas going into, into the mission were that we would see things maybe up to a mass of 100. And so Cassini carried a mass spectrometer that was meant to study Titan's upper atmosphere that went up to a mass of 100. And so we might have thought that the data from that instrument would look something like this. There would be some signal at various places, maybe it would go up to 100. Um, and in fact, that's actually vaguely what those data look like. Um, but those aren't data from that instrument. These are from the plasma spectrometer. And this is what the plasma spectrometer actually showed. I was holding out on you. Um, so as the plasma spectrometer flew th very high in Titan's atmosphere, at altitude about 950 kilometers, um, it measured ions with a mass to charge of up to 10,000. Um, so not 78, but 10,000. And this is the exact same region of the atmosphere where the, ox the energetic oxygen is getting deposited. Um, so we had a lot of questions. First, just to give you a sense of scale, there's benzene, 78, six carbon atoms. I sat one day in ChemDraw, which was the only program that would tolerate me doing this, and made a molecule that weighs 10,000 AMU um, that is not a real molecule for the chemists in the room who are currently cringing at what I've done. Um, just to give you a sense of scale of how wrong we were about the complexity of chemistry occurring in Titan's atmosphere. And Titan was our example of the place with the most complex chemistry in the solar system, and we were wrong by orders of magnitude. Um, the other thing to know about this is because this is a measurement of mass to charge, and these things are pretty heavy, there is a very real possibility that these things are carrying more than one charge. And so what it's actually measuring are things that are more like 30 or 40,000 AMU, which is, you're starting to talk about a large protein. Um, and so there is really complicated chemistry happening in Titan's atmosphere. Unfortunately, uh, we can't identify anything from this data. This is not what this instrument was designed for. Um, it does not have any kind of mass resolution to be able to identify any of the ions that it's seeing, except for maybe the very, very couple smallest ones. And so we were left in this position of having this discovery that I think has really dramatically changed our understanding of how haze formation, how aerosol formation works in Titan's atmosphere, which has implications for understanding how haze formation works in planetary atmospheres, period. But we couldn't identify any of the, of the molecules. So I couldn't tell you if there were amino acids or nucleobases in those measurements because we just didn't have the resolution. Um, at the time that all of this was going on, I was actually working on computer models of atmospheres. And computer models can't do this either. Our models of Titan's atmospheric chemistry are really, really good, up to seven or eight heavy atoms. But a molecule that weighs 10,000 AMU has more like eight or 900 heavy atoms in it. And so there was no way we were ever gonna do this with a computer model. And so that kind of left me with one other place to go, which were experiments. So I mentioned the idea behind these experiments um, a few minutes ago. Um, there are probably five or six groups in the world that do this work and we all operate in kind of the same way. We take our simple abundant atmospheric gases for whatever planet it is that we're studying. So for Titan, you would use nitrogen and methane, maybe some carbon monoxide. For Jupiter, you would have a lot more hydrogen involved. But just the very, very beginning building blocks of this chemistry, you expose it to some kind of energy source. Um, every energy source you can possibly imagine has been used for these experiments at some point in time. Right now, the two standard uh, energy sources are a plasma of some type or an ultraviolet photon source. Um, we use both in my lab at Hopkins. And then you see what happens. 
The energy breaks apart those very simple gases that we start with and initiates chemistry that might result in really interesting things or might result in nothing at all, depending on what the conditions are that we have. Um, it's often the case, especially if you are running a Titan experiment, that it will result in the formation of a solid um, and it's probably going to be organic, um, depending on what your starting gases were. And so that's the very simple picture. The slightly more complex picture of what we do looks like this. So that's a view of our experimental setup. The chamber that we built at Hopkins, we built to be able to study a wide range of atmospheres. And so we can actually go anywhere from 900 to 750 Kelvin, which covers the entire solar system um, in terms of atmospheric chemistry and also covers most of the exoplanets that we're interested in in terms of trying to understand how these processes work. We can use one of two energy sources. We either start our chemistry with a cold plasma or with a Lyman alpha photon source. Um, and that's the, so that's the cartoon version and this is what it actually looks like in real life. Um, in this audience, maybe nobody recognizes this person as Caroline Morley, who is a very excited exoplanet scientist about the work that we have um, been doing. So that's kind of an introduction of how we started working on lab experiments and kind of what the state of our understanding of how haze formation works in planetary atmospheres was about six or seven years ago, which was basically you put some methane in, you get some haze particles out. If the atmosphere doesn't have methane, it's not going to have haze. Okay, we're done. Um, which turns out to not actually be how any of that works. Um, so I'm going to step you through a couple of different questions that we have been asking um, and kind of tell you how that has modified our big picture uh, in terms of understanding how haze formation works. So the first question that I started working on in the lab was actually what was the effect of carbon monoxide on haze formation and also the composition. And this stems from this discovery of these very heavy ions because we knew that this oxygen was getting deposited in the top of Titan's atmosphere and we wanted to know what happened to it once it started participating in the chemistry. But people hadn't really been including carbon monoxide in the Titan experiments. And so we wanted to see what would happen. Um, in the midst of doing all of these experiments, which I've now been working on for quite a long time with carbon monoxide, um, something else happened. So it turns out that Titan is not the only hazy nitrogen, methane, carbon monoxide atmosphere in our solar system. Um, there's at least two, uh, probably three. Um, so on the left is Titan, but on the right is Pluto, so they're to scale. Um, these images were taken at the exact same phase angle, um, and you can see that they're both quite hazy. Um, so Pluto turns out to be hazy, and this picture is just in here in case you've never seen it before. Um, I don't have anything particularly scientific to say, it's just I think this is actually probably one of the most amazing pictures we have ever taken in planetary exploration. So I feel like everyone should see it if they haven't, but that's Pluto. Um, those are mountains on Pluto with the haze above, um, seas of uh, nitrogen ice that are actually convecting on very uh, long time scales. Um, and there's actually some clouds in this picture too, although they're a little bit hard to point out. So we have to amend our question a little bit because it's also important for Pluto. So. We just started putting carbon monoxide into the experiments, first just to see what would happen in terms of production rate, because we had this idea from Miller-Urey that if you put oxygen-bearing molecules into these types of experiments, if you have oxygen-bearing molecules in your atmosphere, that will decrease the chemistry that leads to haze formation. You hear this all the time when people are talking about the early Earth, that as soon as there's oxygen in the atmosphere, the haze goes away. So the first thing we found is that, at least for carbon monoxide, it's not true. The more carbon monoxide we put into the experiments, the more particles we made. So on the x-axis right now and for the next couple plots is the carbon monoxide abundance. Um, and the y-axis is just the total amount of stuff that we're making. So first we did it with 0.1% methane in a UV source. Then we tried it with 2% methane in a UV source. The same thing happened. Then we said, okay, well, let's switch energy sources. We tried it with a, with a plasma from a spark discharge. Same thing happened. The more carbon monoxide we put into the system, the more particles we were getting. And so carbon monoxide, even though it has oxygen in it, was not actually causing us any kinds of problems in terms of haze formation. It was quite the opposite. So we started asking ourselves, well, what's actually happening in the experiment? Is it making particle nucleation more efficient? Is that why we're getting more material? Or is it making particle growth more efficient? Is that what's happening? And the way we were doing these measurements, we could actually answer that question. Because what we were really measuring was the particle size distribution. And so that's what the particle size distribution looked like with 2% methane. We were making relatively small particles. In this case, the diameter was about 20 nanometers. Um, when we put 5% CO in, uh, shown here just to give you the extreme, 
this is what the particle size distribution looked like. And so now we're making particles that are more like 150 or 200 nanometers in diameter. And we're also making a lot more of them. And this was the general trend that we saw. So when we looked at particle size, we found that as we put more carbon monoxide into the gas mixtures, the particles were getting bigger. And so carbon monoxide was helping um, increase the efficiency of growth for particles in the experiment. Um, but when we looked at the number of particles, we saw that the number of particles was also increasing as well. And so carbon monoxide is doing something in these experiments that increases both the, in the efficiency of nucleation, the very first step of forming a particle, but also increases their growth rate. So every time I showed this for many, many years, somebody would raise their hand and say to me, Sarah, you put a bunch more carbon in the system and carbon can make four bonds and it likes to build these nice long chains. And so that's what you did. It's not that interesting. It has nothing to do with carbon monoxide. Go away. <laughs> okay, fine. Point taken. Uh, we've done a lot of work to show that that's not actually true. Um, and I don't remember which plots are in here, so we'll find out. Um, one of the things that we found is we started actually looking at the gas phase composition instead of the solid. So the x-axis is again percent in CO, percent CO in the initial gas mixture. Um, these are a bunch of different molecules in the gas phase, and the only one that I really want you to actually look at are the red diamonds, which is molecular hydrogen. So one of the things that we noticed immediately is that the gas phase composition changes as we put more carbon monoxide into the system, but the only thing that actually decreases substantially is the hydrogen. So the more CO we put into the system, the less gas phase hydrogen there is. And this was really important because we knew from years of Titan experiments that hydrogen really decreases particle formation. And so the CO is actually helping because it's pulling hydrogen out of the system and that makes particle growth more efficient. So then everybody thought, okay, well that's the answer. That's all the CO is doing. It's only helping reduce the, the hydrogen. But we looked at the solid composition also. So now this is looking at, again, CO percent on the x-axis. The y-axis is just elemental mass percent. Um, and what we see is that the more CO we put in the system, the more oxygen we get in the particles. So oxygen is actually participating in the chemistry that leads to particle formation. Um, actually at the expense of carbon and nitrogen um, in a number of different experiments. Uh, it's not just been shown in this one. Um, there's other ones too that I don't have slides of. Um, and so, so that really told us that the CO is, is is playing a couple of different roles. It's modifying the gas phase to make particle growth more efficient, but it's also participating in chemistry that leads to the solid phase. And so this is really interesting because these particles have all four of those atoms that we really care about um, for this type of chemistry. I'm gonna skip that slide and go on to this one. So in, in analyzing the solid phase, one of the things that we decided to look for were some of these molecules that people think are important um, in terms of prebiotic chemistry, uh, people think are important. These are very important to us since they um, compose a lot of what we are made out of. Um, one of the things that we looked for were nucleotide bases and amino acids. And we found all five of the nuclear bases that life on Earth is based on. So the two purine bases, adenine and guanine, and the three pyrimidine bases, um, thymine, uracil, and cytosine. We also found a bunch of nucleobases that life on Earth doesn't use, um, just because we thought we should check. Uh, we also found the two smallest biological amino acids, glycine and alanine, um, which we were able to definitively determine um, based on structure that, th that we were producing them in these experiments. We actually looked for all of the proteinogenic amino acids um, that are composed only of C, N, H, and O, just to see what we would find. The ones in green are the ones that I just mentioned, the ones that we know for sure we have. The ones in yellow were ones where we saw the molecular formula when we did mass spectrometry, but we weren't able to determine the structure. So we don't know if we were making those amino acids or not. We were making something that had the molecular formula of those amino acids. The only molecular formula that we didn't observe are the ones that are at the bottom. So there were four that we didn't see anything with the molecular formula when we ran these experiments. This has been shown to be true by other experiments. This is a paper that just came out last week by a collaborator. And one of the things that we found out, which we think is really important and interesting, is that the more energetic the environment is in the lab, the more of these prebiotic molecules we make. And so we were comparing the results of a plasma experiment to a UV experiment. Um, the plasma experiment is the one that looks like exciting things happened. And the UV experiment is the one over here that's like, well, we found some xanthine and 
Um, some other prebiotic species that we looked for, like urea and guanidine, things that people think might be important precursors. But I think one of the things that tells us is that we, we have a habit, I think, as people who study atmospheres of kind of ignoring the upper atmosphere. Um, it's a challenging place to study for various reasons. The physics is weird and it doesn't really seem like it matters that much. Um, this is probably the most interesting part of Titan's atmosphere in terms of the chemistry that's occurring because there's so much energy at the top of Titan's atmosphere available to drive this type of chemistry um, that you can make some really interesting molecules there. And so I really want to send a mass spectrometer there and go look for alanine and glycine. Um, but I'm not in charge of NASA, as it turns out. I'll mention that in a few minutes, though. Okay, just a quick summary of what we learned from carbon monoxide. The particle size, the number density, and therefore the total amount of mass we were making all increase as a function of increasing CO abundance for both energy sources that we've looked at. We've now done this both in the lab where I was a postdoc and in my lab at Hopkins um, and seen the same result. We've never been able to, hire, to go higher, um, go to higher CO abundances just based on experimental constraints, but I really want to find out if that uh, curve flattens out or turns back over or what it does. Um, the presence of CO decreases the gas phase hydrogen, and it actually changes the, the way that hydrogen um, is located in structures in the solids too, which I didn't show that slide. Um, the aerosols become more oxygen rich um, and less nitrogen rich as the abundance of the carbon monoxide increases. And also the addition of CO results in the production of some of these molecules that we're really interested in for prebiotic chemistry. And I didn't actually point it out when I was showing all of those um, things. CO is the fourth most abundant molecule in Titan's atmosphere, but its abundance is only 50 parts per million. And so actually the lowest point where we were adding CO in those experiments was 50 parts per million to do Titan, and it was still having an effect. So even at 50 parts per million, it increases the production rate of particles in these experiments. Yeah? How does the energy in Titan's exosphere compare to other Earth or Pluto? In between. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Um, so in terms of UV, it's obvious how that scales. Although at Pluto, you actually have to start thinking about UV photons from other stars, which really stresses me out, because um, it's a non-trivial contribution to the photon flux at Pluto compared to our sun. Um, yeah, I see a couple of people looking at me. Um, yes, that's the exactly right way to feel to that statement. Um, the thing about Titan is that um, although Titan is inside of Saturn's magnetosphere and so it's protected from the solar wind in that sense, um, it is getting bombarded by particles from the Saturnian magnetosphere. And so about 10% of the energy input to the top of Titan's atmosphere comes from energetic particles from the Saturn Saturnian magnetosphere rather than from the sun. Um, and the final caveat to that entire statement is that Titan thinks it's hilarious and it's at the very, very edge of Saturn's magnetosphere, and so occasionally it just jumps outside and gets totally blasted by the solar wind and then hops back inside, and we just try to pretend that doesn't happen because it's way too stressful to figure out how to deal with that. Um, so that's carbon monoxide. And so this kind of got me on this kick of trying to think about a bunch of molecules that people had been ignoring, and in the solar system, there's not much room for doing that because most of the planets that do this interesting chemistry in the solar system all have the same molecules as I just showed. Um, so we got interested in working on exoplanets. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the exoplanet experiments that we have been doing. Um, more to the point of understanding this framework of how haze formation works and less specifically about any um, exoplanets in particular. Um, but I will explain at least a little bit about why we picked this particular phase space. So we started out by asking the question of which super Earth and mini Neptune atmospheres will be hazy and um, also wondering what that haze will be like. So why did we pick super Earths and mini Neptunes? So this is a plot that was made from data from the um, Kepler spacecraft that found all of these amazing exoplanets. And one of the really big discoveries of the last few years in exoplanet science is that this class of planets that we don't have in our solar system, so planets that are larger than Earth and smaller than Neptune, are actually the most abundant planets in the galaxy. So we don't have one, which is bad, because we've never studied one before. We don't know how they work. We can't go visit one very easily. Um, but this is the most common planet in the galaxy. And so if we're starting to think about what kinds of atmospheres we're going to be able to observe to study exoplanets, to look for life, um, that's going to be our best option just on sheer numbers in terms of how many of them there are. Um, and there's going to be a lot, yeah? No, that, that actually, we, we have gotten to the point where we can finally rule out observation biases. 
No, we, 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 we have managed to, to fly right past that, which is amazing. Um, the things that we still really can't see are things more like Mercury or Pluto, something that's real small like that. Um, but there's a lot of reasons to believe that that wouldn't be the most common class anyway. Um, and then now, and I need to update this slide because we actually have test planets now, um, but the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite was launched earlier this year. And so Kepler, um, most of the planets that Kepler found, we can't actually observe um, in terms of doing any kind of atmospheric measurements, which is unfortunate. And so TESS is a follow-on planet hunting mission whose purpose is really to find us planets that we can actually characterize. And so based on what we know from Kepler, um, people made predictions about what TESS would see. And again, TESS is going to mostly find this class of planets. And so that was why we decided to focus there. There was one more reason. We do have some atmospheric measurements of planets within this class. And almost without exception, they are turning up with spectra that are flat much to the frustration of everyone who was really excited about looking for biosignatures and exoplanet atmospheres. And so I'm showing you the spectrum here of GJ1214b, which are the white data points over this wavelength range. The um, lines that are also plotted are basically um, hypothetical atmospheres that would have very strong spectral signatures in this wavelength range. So an atmosphere that's pure carbon dioxide or an atmosphere that's pure methane or an atmosphere that's pure water. Um, and we can't, we basically can't reproduce the signatures of, of any real atmosphere because these, these lines are just so flat, this data is so flat. So the only way to really explain that, um, and this comes with the caveat that this is a really small wavelength range, um, but really the only way to explain that type of behavior is that these atmospheres have some kind of particles in them. Particles tend to mute these spectral signatures. They could be clouds, they could be haze, we don't really know, but most of the super Earth and mini Neptunes that we do have data for, which is not a lot, but um, most of them have these really flat spectra. And so this is why we chose this phase space. So to do that, we had to come up with a set of experiments that we wanted to run. And we can't measure the atmospheric composition yet very precisely for any exoplanet atmosphere. And so instead of working from observations, which is what we normally do in the solar system, we know what the atmosphere's background gases are, um, we had to make it up. And so we started with some equilibrium models that spanned a range of temperature and composition space that would encompass these planets that we're interested in. And in particular, what I really want to focus on is looking at the effect of these different molecules, because this is the framework that we're really interested in looking for. So we were trying to span this big range of um, oxidation state. So we started with these equilibrium models. These were our starting gas mixtures. And then we perturbed them by putting energy into them to try to represent the atmospheric chemistry. And so this is what we saw um, when we started doing that. And the main take home message is that we saw a pretty wide range of haze production rates from that matrix that I just showed you. Two of our experiments, the ones that were dominated by water in the gas phase, actually produced more particles than our standard Titan experiment, which was very confusing to us and we still haven't figured out why that's happening. Um, we saw about three orders of magnitude, three and a half orders of magnitude in terms of production rate over those different gas mixtures. Um, one of the things that's really interesting though is actually, and we did this, this is with the plasma. Um, we also did it with the UV energy source. We saw some similar trends, although not quite identical. But one of the things that's really interesting is that actually two of these gas mixtures don't have methane in them at all, none. Um, and they still had a relatively high production rate. And so when we actually measure the composition of those particles, we find that there's carbon in the solid. So the carbon is participating in the chemistry even though it's not coming from methane, it's carbon coming from CO2 or from CO. Um, we also started looking at particle size. So looking at particle size distributions like the ones that I was showing you earlier, um, we see that the particle size really varies depending on what the composition of the initial gas mixture is um, and also what the shape of the distribution looks like. So for the really reduced cases, we made very small particles in a very tight size distribution. Um, for the ones that were more oxidized, we made bigger and bigger particles as we were increasing the oxidation of the gas mixture um, and also the shapes of the particle size distributions really changed. One of the other things that we're really interested in that we haven't been able to do yet, but I can tell you that the results will be important, um, is we actually know that the particle colors are different 
um, because we collected them on disks so that we could do spectral measurements later. We're still working on the spectral measurements because our spectrometer isn't cooperating with us. Um, but we know just from looking at them with our very own eyes that the spectra are going to be different because they're different colors. One of the things that's interesting is those two, um, those two gas mixtures that I mentioned that make um, that have production rates that are similar to our Titan production rate are also similar color to our Titan um, particles. Uh, the flip side of that, I can tell you because we have composition measurements, is that the composition of the particles are completely different. Um, probably the two most different actually sets of particles that are in that whole matrix. And so we have a lot more work to do to try to understand um, what the optical properties of these particles will be, but that has really important implications, um, both for things like the radiative transfer in these atmospheres, but also just for understanding how to do the spectral measurements. If we could get really good spectral analogs, you would be able to pull out some information from these flat spectra that we have right now. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to do to help um, the observers uh, solve this problem. Um, so just a quick summary. Which super Earths and mini Neptunes will be hazy? Uh, we're not really sure. Um, we see that the water dominated cases produce really substantial amount of particles and we're still trying to figure out exactly what's happening um, in terms of the chemistry in those experiments. We see a wide range of um, production rates and so the, the take home message we've had for the people who are planning on, on doing observations with things like the James Webb Space Telescope is that not every super Earth and mini Neptune is going to be hazy. Some of them will have spectral signatures that can be used to measure the atmospheric composition. Um, the visual inspection indicates that the particles are going to have really dramatically different optical properties. It seems to be a function of metallicity more than of temperature, um, but it seems like the metallicity and temperature both matter. Metallicity is our astronomer word for oxidation state, um, is the easiest way to explain it uh, from this talk. Uh, and so we're still trying to investigate that. Um, the other thing that's interesting that I don't have a plot because this paper uh, is under review right now, but in a lot of the experiments, we see the production of molecular oxygen and organics at the same time in the gas phase, um, and even see methane still residual from the experiment um, in the presence of oxygen. And oxygen plus organics or oxygen plus methane is one of the like easy things that people tend to think of as a biosignature. And we're like 99.9% .9 sure that there aren't any creatures living in our chamber. And so we're pretty convinced that that's maybe not the best um, thing to think about in terms of biosignatures um, without having a lot more nuance in terms of understanding the atmosphere. I'm going to quickly talk about early Earth because um, I already got asked about it this morning uh, and then with one minute we'll show you the thing that I really wanted to show you. Um, one of the other things that I got interested in, so I did all of this work on carbon monoxide. We did a bunch of CO2 with the exoplanet stuff and so I figured, to, and water, so I figured to round out the collection of oxygen molecules I needed to actually work with molecular oxygen which had never been done. And so we were really interested in what happens during the period of time when oxygen starts to become present in Earth's atmosphere, um, but it's not at the level that it is today. At the level that it is today, the only time that we get this type of photochemical haze that I'm talking about for Titan is some kind of human input. So you get this stuff, you know, the smog in LA is photochemistry operating on heavier stuff that's been produced. But to get a global haze layer in a planet that has as much oxygen as we do would be almost impossible. Um, but I wanted to know what happens in the interim, because everyone was acting like there was a light switch and the second there was oxygen in the atmosphere, there would be no more haze layer. Um, and this is particularly important because, again, I had kind of started with this idea that we had that oxidized atmospheres were less favorable for photochemistry um, and in terms of haze production. And I think I already showed that that's not true in terms of carbon monoxide and water and CO2, but we wanted to know what happened with molecular oxygen because not all oxygen molecules are the same. I'm skipping that slide. Um, I'm going to walk you through this slowly because the slide is really complicated, but we started out just with the methane nitrogen gas mixture and we saw what everybody has always seen before that there's a there's a spot where um, methane is good and as you put more methane into it you start to decrease production and so aerosol production in these experiments tends to peak around 100 parts per million methane. Then we started adding CO2 and I want you to notice that all of the experiments that had CO2 had more CO2 than methane in them just to start off with because this is more consistent with our understanding of how Earth's atmosphere worked during this time period. So as you can see if you put a little bit of CO2 into these experiments the production rate decreases. So those points are going to move back over here. So now we have no oxygen or CO2 
no O2, and then we're going to start adding um, various amounts of O2 as we go across. So we started with um, two parts per million oxygen and went all the way up to 0.2%. And one of the things that we saw that was really interesting is when you put in a little bit of oxygen, you actually increase particle production. And then after that, it starts to decrease, but it doesn't decrease nearly as rapidly as everybody has been acting like it would. And to give you some sense of scale, um, there's our Titan experiment in this particular lab. So actually a bunch of those uh, gas mixtures make more particles than our standard Titan experiment. Um, I just opened the instrument one day to the lab to figure out what the lab error was. <laughs> um, you can see that the lab wasn't particularly hazy that day, uh, but there were particles. Um, so you might think, okay, well, you know, this is just, this is just background, Sarah, this isn't real. But if you measured everything that went through the entire experiment without the energy source on, that's the number of particles that we were getting, which was effectively zero. So even in the case where we have 0.2% oxygen in the experiments, we're still generating particles from this chemistry. We're just not generating very many of them. Um, and the reason that I point that out is it's important to understand that trying to actually take these laboratory production rates and convert them into a real atmosphere is really challenging um, because there's a lot more physics that goes on in real atmospheres and the time scales are different. Um, and so the fact that the particles are generated is important important, um, but a lot more work would need to be done to actually think about what would happen in a real atmosphere. Um, the one other thing I want to say about that is not on that slide. It's this one. Um, one of the other things that we found that was super interesting is that the addition of O2 increases ni nitrogen fixation in the chemistry. And so as we were putting oxygen into the experiments, one of the things that I started seeing in our mass spectrometer was the formation of organic nitrate in the aerosols. And so this is really interesting because the period of time when this was happening in Earth's history, um, we think that many of the processes that were going on, many of the organic processes, may have been limited by life's ability to fix nitrogen. And so what may have happened during this period of time is that actually as this global haze that people think may have been around um, was dissipating because of the increase of oxygen in the atmosphere, that those haze particles were being converted into organic nitrate before being deposited onto the surface where they could be used by creatures that were starved for organic nitrate at the time. Um, and so it's just important to think about what may have been happening in this time period that people have been treating more like a light switch. Uh, the other thing, which I'm not going to talk about at all other than to say, we also see that the optical properties change really dramatically with the presence of oxygen. The particles that were made with oxygen in the lab were basically perfectly reflecting. They didn't absorb any photons. Um, which is very, very different than the brown orange material that we see in Titan's atmosphere and that we think about for early Earth. Um, so just quickly, uh, actually I'm not going to go through that. We're skipping all those two. Um, so to finish the story that I started, we had this idea that organic haze was produced primarily from methane photochemistry and mildly reducing atmospheres, which just is not true. Um, there are many, many ways to generate photochemical hazes, many pathways that we haven't explored, and it's going to be much more complicated than we would really like it to be, uh, especially now that we have this huge range of atmospheres for exoplanets. Um, there appear to be pathways that don't require methane to produce organic hazes from photochemistry. Um, Oxygen-bearing molecules each play a unique role in haze formation, and so we have to think a lot harder, not just about the oxidation state, but actually what molecules are present. They interact with photons differently, um, they participate in the chemistry differently. And oxidized atmospheres may also be favorable for haze formation. We see that now with some of our exoplanet experiments. Um, the final thought uh, to add about that is that one thing we don't like to think about is that planetary atmospheres change over time. Um, and in general, they evolve to be more oxidized over time because of atmospheric escape. And so as a planet's atmosphere evolves, its haze formation processes will also evolve. And that's really important for the early Earth. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. And finally, I just have one more thing I want to say, which is actually the thing I'm most excited about, except I don't know if I can... How do I make you play? I can't make you play. Um, so the thing I'm most excited about that I'm working on right now, we want to... Oh, come on. No. I can do it. I can do it in real time. I never recommend doing this, but it's really important. I can do it in real time. Um, maybe. We'll find out. This is like a really risky thing. If there's grad students in the room, I don't ever recommend doing this. My grad students would get yelled at if they did this. Um, but it's in here. I know it's in here. Okay. But which one is it? I think it's this one. There we go. 
Uh, I don't know how to view full screen. Uh, there we go. Okay, don't ever do that. That's not a good idea. Okay, um, so we want to go back to Titan and answer this question about the prebiotic chemistry. And so we're currently in the middle of uh, New Frontiers 4 selection. So there are two missions still alive. One is a comet sample return, whatever. Um, the other one is <laughs> called Dragonfly, which is what you're seeing right now, which is a uh, dual quadcopter, um, or also what we're calling a rotocraft lander. Um, so it would take advantage of the fact that Titan has very low gravity and a very thick atmosphere. The atmospheric density is four times that at the surface of the Earth. Um, if you attach wing, wings to your arms, you personally could fly by flapping your arms. Um, and so we take advantage of that to explore Titan. And so we would land, um, sample, measure the composition, um, look at a bunch of other different properties. And then once we got bored there, we would take off and fly somewhere else and go do the same thing again. Um, and that would be really cool, and so NASA should definitely pick that one. And that's all I have to say, <laughs> really. <laughs> I can just answer dragonfly questions. I'm perfectly happy to do that. Yeah? From a novice's point of view, take that, take it for, for that. Mm -hmm. Does the discovery of such complex molecules in the upper atmosphere type open the door to the atmosphere being the place of origin of life? I would say no. Um, although, you know, there's been certainly been proposals over the years about life in, you know, Jupiter's cloud tops. There was a recent paper trying to explain the unknown absorber in the Venusian atmosphere as bacteria on Venus. Um, <laughs> I think, I think, I personally think that probably what life needs to get going is a lot of different circumstances that have all come into play at once and the atmosphere is only going to be a piece of that context. Um, that's a, these are very complicated molecules. <laughs> So that's exactly why we want to go to Titan, because we know that Titan's atmosphere has been producing very complex organic molecules for a long time. We know there are liquids on the surface. Um, there's energy. There's all of the things that we think are required for life, big picture. Um, and we just kind of want to go check and see. So people keep asking, like, what if Dragonfly crashes into a tree? These are people who fly drones at home in their backyard. And we're like, mission success. Like, we're good. <laughs> like, it's a, it's a little bit of a bummer because we had some other things we wanted to do. But like, if Dragonfly crashes into a tree, like, as long as we know that that's what happens, like, we are golden. Like, Nobel Prize for the team. Everybody goes home happy. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's one of the one of the big questions that we have. And, and if there isn't life on Titan, why? Because that tells us something about our understanding of the requirements for life. Bob? Um, so I assume you don't get long chain hydrocarbons in Venus's atmosphere. In terms of making the aerosols on Venus? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm going to refuse to answer most of it because my grad student hasn't managed to, to actually get the last measurement we need to write this very important paper. But um, on <coughs> Venus, most of the aerosol that we see in the Venusian atmosphere are actually clouds, sulfuric acid droplets. Um, but there are a number of different types of absorbers, and there's an absorber above the cloud tops that absorbs very strongly in the UV and is completely transparent in the visible that has absolutely defied anyone's attempts to identify it over the years, um, which led to, led to this recent paper of people saying, well, maybe it's bacteria because we can't seem to get anything else to work. Um, I think we know what it is, but I'm not going to tell you. Sorry. <laughs> but you don't get long chain hydrocarbons in the Venusian atmosphere. Um, it, just because it's so oxidized. So, so there is some. There, there, is, a, there is an extreme. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't make particles. It just means that they won't be hydrocarbon particles. Yeah. Yeah? Oh, sorry, I forgot you. Enceladus? Yeah. Exactly. So that's kind of a very unique situation in proximity. 
get the same kind of we can get the same uh, influx of waters and commentary water from the same thing in the upper atmosphere. Then the oxygen coming down. Yeah, so for, we've actually known about the CO in Titan's atmosphere since Voyager, but we only knew about the plumes of Enceladus from Cassini. So we had about 30 years where we had no idea where the carbon monoxide was. Sorry about that. Well, I am just doing all of the things that you don't do when you give a talk today. Um, so we had 30 years of trying to figure out where the CO was coming from without knowing about this oxygen source. And one of the possible explanations was just that there was water coming in from interplanetary dust particles. Maybe there had been a comet impact. Um, it turns out that water isn't the right solution. We need it to actually be already broken up. So it doesn't matter if it's OH or if it's O+, but we need the bond to already have been broken before it enters Titan's atmosphere for the chemistry to actually work the way that we need it to. Um, that said, there's obviously going to be a flux of interplanetary dust, but it seems to be overwhelmed by um, the oxygen that's coming from Enceladus in the form of either OH or O+, or some of the other ions that might get made. Um, one of the interesting things about that, though, that, that um, you kind of mentioned in, in the lead up to the question was that, um, you know, this is a unique situation in some sense between Enceladus and Titan, but we have one other example of it in the solar system, which is Io and Europa. And so this material that's coming out of the volcanoes on Io ends up on Europa, and that's full of sulfur. And so one of the things that I think is interesting that hasn't been explored as much as I would like it to be is the potential role of these moon systems in terms of setting up the disequilibrium that might be a important for life. So in and of themselves, the two moons might not be habitable, but given the connection between the two and this, this geologic forcing that's maintaining disequilibrium on these, on these planets um, might be something that life could really take advantage of. Um, and so I think these moon systems might be a really great place to look for life also. So we should also go to Europa and Enceladus, but we have to go to Titan first, because that one's cooler. <laughs> Sonia? Yeah, so probably more people know what Star Trek is than the Planetary Protection Office at NASA, so, so I always like to explain it. Um, NASA has, uh, NASA, Star Trek has the prime directive. You don't mess up the place that you're going. We have to do the same thing when we send spacecraft to places that we think might have life or places that could harbor Earth life. So anywhere in the solar system that has liquid water like makes NASA really stressed out because that means that anything that hitches a ride on one of our spacecraft could you know, make a nice happy home and, and go do whatever it's gonna do. Um, and so anytime we go to one of these places and every place in the solar system has a planetary protection classification, which tells us how careful we have to be. So you can imagine that if you were sending a probe into the sun, you wouldn't have to talk to the planetary protection officer, but that if you wanna send a, a boat uh, to Titan or um, a submarine to Europa, that you have to have a lot of conversations with the planetary protection officer about how you're going to make sure that you don't um, forward contaminate the place that you're going. And so there's all kinds of cleaning procedures. You end up spending a lot of time making sure that every possible thing on your spacecraft can be heated to like 500 C or blasted with um, uh, peroxide and all of these other things. Um, and so it is something that we have to be really careful about. The good news is that we want to be careful anyway because the last thing in the world we want is to see some creature crawl across the camera lens and have no idea if it was a Titan creature or an Earth creature. <laughs> so there's a little bit of like a self-protective instinct to make sure that we don't screw the place up either. And then if you do sample return, like the comet mission that Dragonfly is in competition with right now, then you have to do planetary protection twice because you have to worry about forward contamination, but then you also have to make sure we don't have some kind of Andromeda strain situation when you bring the samples back to Earth. See, I use the pop culture references because they make a lot more sense to people than what NASA does. Um, but yeah, it hasn't, our planetary protection challenges are challenges, um, but since there isn't liquid water on the surface, that helps us. Um, the flip side of that is the Dragonfly is powered by an RTG, and so if we were to sit in one spot for a very, very long time, we could melt ourselves a little pool of water. Yeah, which is why we had to crash Cassini into Saturn, because Cassini had RTGs with it, so if it landed on an icy surface, it would eventually melt itself a nice little pool of water. Someone over here had a question, yeah. yeah question going back, uh, some slide in the second half, you were talking about, um, I think a recent paper, some colleagues, you said mm -hmm. there were two columns, one was yeah. plasma energy and the other was UV. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. So is, and there's a vast difference in results. Uh -huh. Is the plasma, what is plasma, what is plasma referred to in that yeah. sense? And is there a difference in the actual energy supply? That's a great uh, energy question. Is it just the type of energy and what implications might this have for possible energy sources? And this is the slide, right? In an upper atmosphere, oh, yeah. It was the slide. It might be the slide. Yeah. <laughs> so in this case, the, the plasma experiments were run in my lab at Hopkins. We use a cold plasma. We, uh, it's just going to be one of those days. Anyway, we, we at least vaguely got it. We got it. We use a cold plasma. And so um, all that means is that the, the electrons generated by the plasma are energetic, obviously. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a plasma. But the plasma itself doesn't heat the background gases. And so the neutral temperature in the chamber is basically where we started. It's just, <laughs> just going to save us all the pain of this by making that stop. Um, and so the, the neutral gases stay at whatever temperature we started with. And so um, the electrons are able to dissociate things, but they're not dumping a ton of energy um, otherwise in terms of thermal energy into the experiment. The UV source in this case um, was a deuterium lamp, which actually is a plasma itself. It's just that instead of using the electrons, you use the photons that are generated by the plasma. Um, in terms of total energy flux, the two energy sources are effectively comparable once you take into account the resonance time in our two different setups, which are different because we're using different flow rates. Um, the area where it's a little bit harder to think about comparing things is thinking about the individual interactions um, and whether or not the individual photons themselves or the individual electrons themselves are actually more energetic. Um, and so I would say this is like one of the biggest challenges in the way that we do these experiments is trying to come up with an energy source that's actually analogous in any useful way to what's happening in an atmosphere. And I keep like begging people to make me a star in my lab. Um, and if it could have a dial so that I could change the stellar type for the exoplanet work, that would be even better. Um, but apparently that's asking a lot. So <laughs> it's why we do the different energy sources um, is because these energy sources are actually quite different in terms of, of, the, of the actual interactions, we feel like trends that we see that are, that are the same in both energy sources are probably a really robust thing and that that is something that we can expect to happen in atmosphere. Things like, things like what was there, which is now gone, um, where there seems to be a big difference in the energy source, then we need to think a lot harder about either where the process might happen in the atmosphere or if we've done something that is so far away from what actually happens in a real atmosphere that we can't expect it to happen and so it's really important in this work that we're doing to always remember that we have not made a real atmosphere that we have just made a thing we can control and then we always have to try to go back to when we can observations um, when we can't to try to work with modelers to make sure that we're actually moving forward in terms of understanding what's going on I don't know if that actually answered your question or not <laughs> anybody else Oh, wait, there's one. So, do you think all the stability is that things are compatible in terms of they get more stable, lifetimes get longer as they get harder, or is there a stability threshold? That's a great question that I wish I knew the answer to. <laughs> um, I think in this region, in, in Titan's atmosphere, in this region of the atmosphere, they almost certainly have to be getting more stable as they're getting larger, because otherwise they wouldn't get bigger in the first place. Um, in, in that region of the atmosphere, which I didn't mention when I said this, but at 950 kilometers in Titan's atmosphere, the mean free path is a kilometer. Um, the residence time of these molecules in that region of the atmosphere is hundreds of years. And so they're just getting absolutely blasted by energy from the sun and by energetic particles from Saturn's magnetosphere. So if they're not stable against that type of energy, they're not going to survive there. They're not going to be able to grow and get bigger. So I think those molecules are probably very stable. Um, the stuff we make in the lab has to be at least somewhat stable because otherwise it wouldn't survive all of the things that it has to survive for us to get it into an instrument to analyze it. Um, and we've not made things that are nearly this big in the lab, though. I think the biggest molecule that anybody has actually measured um, from one of these experiments is somewhere on the order of about 1,000 AMU. We've never made anything that is 10,000 AMU, although those size molecules start to resist being analyzed by a lot of techniques, so it gets to be challenging. Uh, multiple charge masses or something that you have seen something that's just 
No, no. The, so the, the thing that was nice about that instrument is because it was meant to measure things, so what it's really measure, measuring, what it was really measuring is energy. And so because it was meant to measure these very energetic things, um, or sorry, the relationship between mass and energy, because it was meant to measure these very small, extremely energetic things, when it got to Titan's atmosphere where everything is thermalized, the energy of the ions was very low, so that enabled it to be able to measure very high masses. Um, people spent a lot of time double checking what you just mentioned, a bunch of other things, and we're pretty sure that the result is real. There's a bunch of trends in the data that seem to make sense in terms of how the densities change as a function of altitude in the atmosphere. We see them on every single flyby um, until the instrument uh, died. It's actually the only, um, the only instrument that wasn't functioning when the mission ended, um, which was really unfortunate. It actually saved the spacecraft um, a week before the first Titan flyby that had been designed to be optimized for it because it wasn't a Titan instrument, and so they had never optimized a flyby to do measurements with it. And then apparently once it got the chance, it was like, no, I don't want to anymore, and then turned the entire spacecraft off, which is like a really big overreaction to not wanting to do something. Um, but we're pretty sure that, that that really was what we were seeing. The, the main question being, you know, how many charges were those things really carrying? And I should actually add an addendum now. Sorry to keep talking. Um, I, haven't, I haven't given this talk actually since the Cassini end of mission results became public. So I need to add another slide because it turns out that Saturn's upper atmosphere is also way more complicated than we thought it was going to be. And we see molecules in Saturn's upper atmosphere that are way heavier than anything that had been predicted prior to Cassini as well. And so, um, and that was done by a different instrument. Um, and so I think upper atmospheres are way, and I hate to say this, my PhD advisor was an aeronomer and he's gotten awfully smug these days because he's feeling very much like upper atmospheres have been overlooked this whole time and now they're turning out to be some of the most interesting places for organic chemistry. Uh, but Saturn does it too. Not as big, well, we wouldn't be able to know because the instru this instrument wasn't functioning. But from other instruments, we see very heavy mass ions in Saturn's upper atmosphere too. There don't seem to be people okay, mad. Right. Go ahead. In terms of the chemistry? I mean, that's actually a really interesting question and I'd never thought about it that way, but it's certainly true that it might look very different. So on Jupiter, for example, the only place that we see benzene is in the aurora. And so the auroral chemistry on Jupiter produces benzene, but otherwise there aren't any regions of the atmosphere where the, um, where the combination of the energy and the background composition is sufficient to produce benzene. And so I think you would still see really complex chemistry in Titan's atmosphere, but the, the um, distribution of it might be really different if Titan had its own magnetic field. Um, we tried valiantly to try to study what happened to the chemistry whenever it hopped outside and got blasted by the solar wind. Um, but it turns out the distribution of how many flybys we had during the mission didn't really give us good phase space in terms of like before, after, during, and then having to take into effect the solar cycle and a bunch of other stuff. And so it's been really hard to find patterns in terms of energy input and how it's related to the, to the ions that we see in the atmosphere, um, other than day side, night side variations, which we were able to look at. Um, but that's a really interesting question. I actually hadn't thought about it that way. Um, the only example that we have that would be a, a useful analogy is Jupiter. Yeah. 